Hi, Teen Science. Today, we're going to talk about translation. Um, we've already talked about DNA replication. We've talked about transcription. And those things occur in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. We've talked about uh, processing of the RNA that includes adding a five prime cap, splicing out the introns, and adding a poly A tail. And that's something that only occurs in eukaryotes. Uh, but today we're going to talk about translation from mRNA into a protein, a process that occurs in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Recall that translation is part of the central dogma where DNA makes RNA makes proteins. And we've talked already about the fact that transcription, the process of going from DNA to RNA, refers to rewriting something in the same language. But translation is uh, just like translating from Spanish to English. We're changing languages. We're going from the language of nucleic acids to the language of amino acids. And those amino acids are what make up, ultimately, the proteins that do all the jobs within our cells. You'll also recall from several weeks ago in Biology 183, we talked about the different structural levels of a protein. The primary structure is made up of the list of amino acids that are found in a protein. The secondary structure includes alpha helices and beta sheets that are found within the um, folded protein. The tertiary structure builds off of these alpha helices and beta sheets and includes additional other folding of the protein. And then the quaternary structure could be more than one protein working together to form a complex that does an enzymatic function. Today we'll be focusing first of all on how proteins actually build this primary structure of amino acids and that's done with the help of a molecular machine called a ribosome. There are four steps typically in translation. Um, tRNA charging is what this video will be focusing on. There's another video that I've posted that talk about the steps that involve the ribosome, including initiating translation at the ribosome, elongating the amino acid chain, and then terminating translation. This video, however, is going to focus on building the tRNAs. Let's start by looking at a diagram of a tRNA. On the left here, you can see a sequence, uh, a set of bases for the tRNA. Because like its name suggests, tRNA is just made up of RNA. This is a single-stranded molecule. However, it folds up onto itself um, by forming these hairpin loops. And these hairpin loops can uh, fold together to form a complicated 3D structure. So even though RNA is thought of as a single-stranded molecule, it can have complicated 3D structures. And there are some important aspects of the tRNA that I want you to notice. Down here on the bottom in pink is shown the mRNA. And you can see this mRNA has the sequence GCA. What's important about the tRNA is that it has a sequence that aligns with the mRNA. The three bases in the mRNA are called the codon. The three bases that match it in the tRNA are called the anticodon. And note that the mRNA is read from 5' prime to 3'. Prime, while the anticodon must be antiparallel, so the anticodon is 3'. Prime, to five prime, okay? So we've got the anti-codon loop that interfaces with the mRNA. And then on the opposite end of the molecule from this, we have the amino acid attachment site, okay? The amino acid attachment site is where we're going to hook up the appropriate amino acid. Recall that the codon in mRNA codes for an amino acid, 
This tRNA, T for transfer, will transfer the correct amino acid, the correct amino acid for the codon that's listed in the mRNA. So let's look at the different amino acids that we have to choose from. You've probably seen this table of amino acids before. We're not going to focus on the characteristics of them, although I hope that you remember these from earlier in the semester. We've got our nonpolar side chains, our polar side chains, and our polar side chains that are even electrically charged. Each of these amino acids can be built together with the help of the ribosome, but first they must be added to a tRNA. Okay, so let's look at how that addition of an amino acid to a tRNA would work. We're zooming in right now on the connection between a tRNA, over here on the left, and an amino acid, shown on the right. And you can see on the right-hand side here, we've got the NCC, which is the characteristic backbone for an amino acid. Next, I'd like you to notice here, we've got the three prime end of the tRNA. And we're zooming in on that in this green box here. You see we've got C, C, A for the bases on the end of the tRNA. Here's C, C, and here's A for adenine. And we've zoomed in on the adenine molecule. You can see that the amino acid is actually attached to the three prime carbon of the tRNA. So this very three prime end is where the amino acid will get attached. We've talked a lot of, in this course about enzymes, and you can see here we're talking about another enzyme here, a synthetase. This is an amino acyl tRNA synthetase. That is an enzyme that synthesizes amino acids and tRNAs together. And here on the right is our cartoon of amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So down here at the bottom, you can see we've got the anticodon of the tRNA, uh, shown CGU. And then on the right, we've got the specific amino acid binding to our enzyme. And then it costs one ATP, but we can bind together the three prime end of the tRNA with the carbon of the amino acid. So it's with the help of an amino acyl tRNA synthetase that each tRNA can get hooked up with its specific amino acid. And recall that we have 20 different amino acids. That means there's got to be at least 20 different amino acyl tRNA synthetases floating around in our cells, in the cells of E. coli, and in the cells of plants, animals, bugs, and any other organisms you can think of. These amino acyl tRNA synthetases that do the job of hooking tRNAs up to their specific amino acids have to be very vigilant. On the left here, you can see we've got an overlapping sequence of two tRNAs, one that codes for the amino acid glutamine, and one for phenylalanine. And I think you can see that the general tRNA shape is very similar in both of them. Uh, but there are some distinguishing features, not the least of which is differences in the anticodon. These differences in the anticodon have to do with the fact that the codon sequence in the mRNA will be different depending whether we want to encode a glutamine or a phenylalanine. For example, a phenylalanine could be coded by U, U, U in the mRNA. That would mean that the anticodon would need to be A, A, A. Of course, if we were talking about looking at a glutamine sequence, uh, in the mRNA we'd be looking at C, a, A, and that means in the anticodon, the tRNA would be G, U, U. So the different appearance of the anticodon region of the tRNA 
comes from the fact that there are different sequences for the different tRNAs, each affixed to their own specific amino acid. Ultimately, each of these specific tRNAs, and you can see a phenylalanine tRNA right here, we've got the three prime to five prime anticodon. Um, each of these specific tRNAs here, one, two, three, four. Four are shown here, but there could be 20 or more inside any cell. Each of these tRNAs are important for delivering their specific amino acid to the ribosome during protein synthesis so that that amino acid can get added to the growing peptide chain. And we'll talk more about this process of translation, building that peptide chain in the next video. I'll see you soon to talk about initiation, elongation, and termination of translation at the ribosome.